Columbia, Houston. Your wake up this morning was provided by the 1980 U.S. Air Force Academy Drum and Bugle Corps. Good morning. All right, good morning, Kay. And uh, just to let everyone know, we have two former Drum and Bugle Corps members up here and three former Academy grads up here. And it was really happy hearing that song. It's been a long time. Will we copy that? This is Mission Control Houston. The wake up music for the crew of Columbia this morning was uh, provided by the 1980 Air Force Academy Drum and Bugle Corps, featuring uh, Cadet Susan Helms on xylophone playing Flight of the Bumblebee. Actually, three days into what NASA hopes will be a record setting mission. 17 days is the goal right now, and joining us from space, uh, traveling along at about uh, 28,000 kilometers per hour, about 266 kilometers above the Earth, and I believe somewhere over Africa are uh, five members of Columbia's crew. Let's begin with Commander uh, Tom Hendricks. Uh, Commander, first of all, the goal is 17 days. Are you on track right now? As I understand it, you're conserving power in, in an effort to stay up there and set that record. Well, that's uh, partly true. We plan to conserve power in any event with what we call a, a groupie power down, which is an extended uh, stay on orbit power down. And midway through the mission, we hope that our management will give us the go for that 17-day record. 17 days, uh, I guess we have to put that in perspective a little bit because uh, on the Russian space station Mir, we heard last week uh, that the crew, which has been up there for some months, will be delayed by 40 days. So the delay for the Russians exceeds our record by about three times. Give me a sense of how you and the other crew members might feel about spending as long as 40 days or perhaps uh, months in space. Hi, my name is uh, Rick Lenahan. I'm the MS-1 on the flight. And, uh, I actually look forward to spending more time in space after this. Uh, if we get the uh, International Space Station up, we'll be staying up there for periods of uh, two to three months at a time. And this shuttle flight is probably the things to come in that way. Uh, we're trying to uh, figure out how the human body reacts uh, in long duration space travel. We get this data, we're getting a lot of good life sciences data, we'll be able to put that to uh, work. Russians also have got some uh, data and we'll be building the station with them and uh, combining our resources and talents. Despite all the data that does exist between uh, NASA and the Russians about longevity in space, there's still a lot we need to know. Is that correct? As I understand it, there are all kinds of uh, problems, I guess you could call them problems, which astronauts encounter when they're in space, among them bone loss, muscle loss, problem sleeping, and uh, not to mention the fact space adaptation sickness. Now, as I understand it, uh, two-thirds of all astronauts have this space adaptation sickness, and I don't, uh, I'm not going to ask anybody here if they ever have had it, but if you could tell me what the symptoms are, how long it lasts, and what can be done about it. Okay, I'd be happy to take that one. Uh, we have been doing some excellent work up here uh, looking for the answers of why and how those very things happen. To give you a little bit of example of some of the symptoms people can experience, uh, normally the body experiences a major fluid shift immediately after the ascent is complete, and this fluid shift can uh, bring on a lot of strange symptoms such as fullness of the head, uh, stuffy nose, uh, stomach awareness, and um, headaches, and as it, turn, as it goes on and on, people get used to it, and they adapt to zero-G usually within uh, hours. Uh, in our case, everybody here adapted very, very quickly. We've had just an outstanding flight from the standpoint of adaption, so if the scientists were hoping to capture a lot of data on that on our crew, they're probably not going to get a whole lot. Our mission is looking at not only SMS, which is the space motion sickness adaption, but we're also looking at uh, other areas of the life science arena to include uh, bone loss, which is a very, very important uh, thing to look at when you're talking about long duration space flight because of bone mass losses that have been documented in the past. And in addition, we've got a, a real special group of experiments here looking at muscular uh, bone skeletal function, and uh, they're, they're being done on a, the torque velocity dynamometer machine, which we have in the background here. And this has been going very well. We're hoping to bring back lots of good science for the life scientists back on Earth. In a sense, uh, 
uh, you all are sort of uh, acting as guinea pigs up there. And we're going to want to talk a little bit about some of the tests that are ongoing. But let me introduce to you uh, Relitza Vasilova, who's sitting here beside me here at CNN Center. She has a couple of questions for you. Go ahead, Relitza. I'm interested, uh, once you're back on Earth, how do you adapt uh, to the Earth conditions again? What do you experience? You, you've had bone loss, you've had muscle loss, motion sickness. How do you feel when you, when you get off the shuttle? When you readapt uh, to Earth, one of the uh, things that happens is that you feel very heavy because we've been floating around here, in our case, it'll be two and a half weeks. Also, your balance is a little bit off. Your inner ear, those little hair follicles, tell you where gravity is. Well, we haven't been using them while we're up here in space, and so they're out of calibration. So you tend to uh, stagger a bit, and you've never passed any uh, policeman's uh, DWI test. But it... Uh, you readapt to uh, gravity very quickly, and in my case, after just one day, I go back to normal. Well, I must confess, looking at it all behind you, it looks a little bit like a health club, an orbiting health club. Now tell me, uh, what's it like exercising in space? Uh, I guess there's uh, no weightlifting, right? Well, believe it or not, it's pretty similar to what you would uh, do back on Earth, except um, you just don't have the you just don't have the gravity that'll hold you down to things. So, uh, because of that, we have to use special seats, uh, strapping, uh, different harnesses that'll keep us in one spot while we exercise. As you can see, if we let go, we just float away, and that can't happen. So right now, in back of me, Chuck is on the ergometer, and uh, it's probably a little tough to see, but he's coming off now. He was just strapped down to a special seat and uh, was using special pedals, uh, racing pedals, actually, to keep himself in the uh, contraption. And uh, he's able to exercise and uh, get up to uh, just about the same workload as you would down on Earth. It's actually more comfortable because uh, you can kind of float and relax while you're exercising. But now everyone knows why they invented Velcro, I guess. Tell me, uh, Dr. Linehan, we had, we've been talking about the, uh, the life science aspects as it relates to humans. You've got a lot of critters on board, which you're taking care of. How's uh, all that doing? Give us kind of a broad brush on what you have going on there. Well, we're flying uh, uh, some uh, uh, rodents and uh, fish embryos. Actually, we're flying some uh, white lab rats, 12 of them, and some uh, fish embryos to study embryological development. And what we're really looking at there is uh, they're, they're spending their time up in space with us, uh, and uh, we're going to look at the developmental changes that might occur in the fish embryos due to a lack of gravity, or should I say microgravity, not a lack of gravity, and also uh, look at the changes, uh, physiological changes that might occur in the uh, rats that we have and compare them to the uh, physiology of humans when they get back. Look a lot that way putting them on the treadmill. Let's talk to the, uh, the, the mission, or the, excuse me, the payload specialist. I, I didn't catch who that is, who just got off the uh, machine there. How do you feel? That's uh, Dr. Chuck Brady. He's mission specialist number three. feel great. In fact, uh, exercising really helps you up here. I, uh, first, a uh, real good exercise I've had, and uh, we're doing some studies on the uh, maximal oxygen uptake that the body can uh, do in space, but uh, I feel wonderful coming off of it, and uh, good to be back with my crewmates here. You don't seem out of breath. I'm very impressed. You must be in good shape. Thanks for coming aboard. We're signing off from Columbia, 146 miles over the Earth. This is Mission Control Houston. This uh, television is from Columbia's Cargo Bay cameras showing the east coast of the United States. Columbia just now passing off uh, the Atlantic seaboard. Club Huntsville for Alfie. Go ahead, Ralphie. Susan, just to remind that uh, oxygen uh, tank valve should be opened before the 
ask the pre uh, FT test for MS1. It's scheduled in about 15 minutes from now. Okay, look, I'm going to call so we don't forget. Thank you. Thank you. 